Our gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 8, beginning with the 31st verse. This comes after Peter has declared Jesus as the Messiah. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, And if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the son of man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father and with his only holy angels the word of god for the people of god thanks be to god amen Let us pray. Lord, we, your people, have gathered here this day, and we ask your Holy Spirit to move, to come and be with us, to move freely about us, over us, in us. Come, Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Lead the meditations in our hearts and minds. May they be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and redeemer. Come, Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Amen. Last week, on the first Sunday in the season of Lent, we revisited the story of Jesus' baptism, and we heard how he came up from the waters, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and it wasn't just a glorious day. Yes, it was a glorious day, but the Holy Spirit then directed him to go into the wilderness. And that happened before he began his ministry of proclaiming the good news of God and calling people to repent and and to live, believe in that good news. That happened before Jesus ever called the first disciple to follow him. As we make our way up to Jerusalem on our Lenten journey this year, on this second Sunday in the season of Lent, we hear the story, we hear the call to take up, to take up the cross. Now, if you've been in church for any length of time, you've heard this before. Take up the cross and follow me. During the year, we sing many a song about the cross. We lift high the cross. We survey the wondrous cross. In the cross of Christ, I glory. And those are just a sampling of the songs that we sing about the cross. And when we sing those songs, depending on what's going on in our life or the day or the season, it can lead us into a time of reflection or we sing it rather triumphantly. Not only do we sing songs about the cross, we have crosses of various sizes placed throughout the church. A good scavenger hunt or game for our youth and children would be to go throughout the entire campus, both inside and outside, and count all the crosses you see. There are 10 here in the sanctuary alone. Now let me tell you, after the early service, I was told, you're wrong. (laughs) they said pastor there are 13 crosses you missed some (laughs) well actually i had eight until this morning when i saw that there are two crosses that i missed that are on either side of the altar and that's not counting the crosses that you see along the side wall so i invite you to count the crosses just not during the sermon okay do it later so yes there are a lot of crosses here and there are a lot of crosses in the worship uh, contemporary worship space So yes, we are surrounded by crosses. And that doesn't count the cross. I I remember to put it on this time. The last time I referred to the cross, it wasn't there. We're talking about our, our necklaces, the crosses that dangle in our earrings, and even the crosses that we might have as tattoos. When we come to the church, we expect to see crosses. A distinguishing feature of the, of the church is to have a steeple. And what's on top of the steeple? But a cross. That is a symbol of our faith, the cross. 
We're called to follow and to take up the cross. Many years ago, I went to a conference at a mega church in a mega city. <laughs> it was my first experience ever being in a church that had escalators in the foyer. I mean, it was that mega of a church. It was an impressive facility, an impressive sanctuary, and I rode up that escalator as if I've never ridden an escalator before, and I then go to the balcony and overlooking this vast sanctuary, and I thought, wow, wow, how 8,000, 10,000, I don't know how many could sit in this sanctuary. It probably wasn't that much, but it was huge. Cutting-edge technology at the time, but, but I noticed as I was going, There was no cross. People from all over the country had come to that church and there was no cross. There was no cross in the sanctuary. I found that shocking. But I also found it more than a little off-putting. There wasn't a single cross in the sanctuary. I had to assume with all their technology, boom, there's the cross during the services then maybe they understood that the cross was too offensive. Too tusk of an act, too, touch, t- too much of a tough ask. Too off-putting to those seekers. Too over the top even for church members. As I think about it, it makes me wonder what that church or any church is motivated by. The plethora of members or people who are willing to pick up the cross and be disciples. They can be the same thing, members and disciples, but sometimes not. I served a church, and I'm not going to tell you the city, because that might give it away, where we had a church member make a life-size cross, cedar beam. And he crafted it and and had it ready for our Lenten journey. And on Palm Palm Passion Sunday, I had church members walk it in as I'm preaching. And then we assembled the cross. And I'm still preaching. Drove in the nails and then lifted up the cross. That cross is still used in that church every Lent and every Easter. It's a beautiful cross. Word spread about that cross. How wonderful it was. And the reason why I know word spread beyond the church about the cross is because a a film crew called about the cross made of cedar beams. See, a film crew was producing a Christian movie in the sanctuary of a nearby church. And in the movie, and they had this idea, and I think the idea was coming to them as they're living, they're trying to live out what's going on in the scene. And they had this idea now that the main actor was going to go into the sanctuary and be captivated by a cross and have this aha moment or this discovery of a a prayer-filled moment with God. And they wanted our cross for that dramatic scene. I found the phone call I received rather humorous. We're at such and such a church, and we're doing this film with Eric Estrada. Now, for those who are my age and older, think chips, chips. Don't start humming the tune, please don't. The conversation went something like this. Can we borrow your cross? We need a cross for the scene. I thought I was being punked. And I responded some, something along the lines of this. Don't you have a cross to use? <laughs> Isn't there already a cross where you are? Now, after I got a little snarky, I let them borrow the cross on 
Well, two conditions. One condition, they bring it back. (laughs) The other condition is at the end of that movie, when they're offering the credits, cross was brought to you by the United Methodist Church. On one level, I I find that remembrance rather humorous. But on another level, incredibly sad. Not when I see the lack of a cross in a church, but in my own reflections. And, And sad when I recognize within myself the unwillingness to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Or spend too much time trying to cater to the needs of members to make them happy so they stay. Instead of going out into the community to tell the Jesus story out there in the marketplace. See, we can surround ourselves with the symbols of our faith and we hear the call to follow and still have the unwillingness to take that cross up. We can do a great deal in life for the church that doesn't involve the way of Jesus. We can become deaf to the call to take up that cross when we fill our lives and our calendars with so many good things and we can seek to be just pleasant, nice people and seek to do good in all that we say and do and still fall short of living out the call of discipleship. See, we can get way out in front of God and then ask God to catch up to where we are and then bless us. And just because we mention the name of God or Jesus, then all of a sudden we're doing what Jesus is calling us to do. And we're being the church that Jesus needs for us to be. See, we can, we can say all kinds of churchy words. That's not a word. It, it, it didn't like it when I typed in churchy. It did not like that word. But you know what I'm talking about. We, we have this lingo that we can use throughout the year, not just during Lent. And those churchy words are, are baptism and forgiveness, grace, Holy Spirit, journey. We can share in Holy Communion. We can give up chocolate and cussing for 40 days. One of these days, don't count, this day doesn't count, so I'm not telling you to cuss all you want to, but you know, it, is that what Lent is all about? Giving up chocolate and cussing and feel that that's what the season is really all about when the idea is that we are to be better at this thing called living out the Christian faith come Easter than we were when we started on Ash Wednesday and even before that, last year when we were starting on Ash Wednesday and the year before that, we're supposed to be moving up, if you will, journeying with Jesus as we pick up the cross and follow where God is leading us. And the way to get better, the way to get better to living the Christian life is to hear the call to take up that cross and follow Jesus. To make the decision to pick up the cross, to take up that cross, not just for a season or on Sundays, but every single day. For the way to truly follow Jesus is to take up the cross and follow him. Church, that's not my idea. That's not... The United Methodist Church's idea, those are words from Jesus. Discipleship is God's big idea for the church and for all who seek to follow Jesus. Jesus, the one who died to free us from the weight and penalty of sin and rose from the grave so that we would be graced with the gift of salvation and eternal life. This Jesus calls us to new life. This Jesus has the right to ask something of us. And so we're not to follow Jesus on our terms, in our way, but on God's terms, in God's way. And that way was not only for Jerusalem, for Jesus to be lifted up on the cross, but the way for us today is still the way of the cross. German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book called The Cost of Discipleship Define cheap grace as preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. 
show this season of Lent. Every season of Lent is supposed to be this kind of trial time, this, this training time, if you will, this testing period where we seek to get closer to God, where we seek to let go of certain things, where we let go of past sins, as we let go of that which is binding us down. And we add certain disciplines to our walk with Jesus. And on the second Sunday in the season of Lent, what do we hear? What do we hear about what we let go, what we add? If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Take up your cross not only in the season of Lent as we journey up to Jerusalem, but as a way of life well beyond Easter. See, what Jesus was asking then and what Jesus is asking us now, it's a tough ask. And yet if we hear it and we're hearing it, and we still seek to do our own thing, then are we church? Or more of a social club, a membership club. You know, Jesus had called the 12 disciples to follow him with a few simple words. At the, at the very, very beginning, there was no mention of the cross. Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you fish for people. And now as they've been following, they're witnessing Jesus healing. They're witnessing the teaching. They're hearing what he's having to say. And then he starts to foretell what's going to happen to him, his, his suffering and death and then resurrection. If I were a disciple, I'd have a hard time hearing about resurrection. I'd, I'd have a hard time hearing suffering and, and death. They were now hearing Jesus speak about these words. And they're slow to understand. And I get that. Peter is so offended by this teaching of Jesus that he, the student, sought to rebuke Jesus, the teacher. That exchange is unthinkable. And yet Peter, as he was prone to do, was speaking not just for himself, but for all disciples. And Peter, like the other disciples and all those in the crowd, they had this understanding of what the Messiah was to do. Remember, he just said, Jesus, you are the Messiah. And they had this understanding of what the Messiah would bring, what this Messiah would do. This Messiah would come and set the world to rights on our terms, diminishing the oppressive Roman rule, coming in to rule with power and might and with great authority. A Messiah in their eyes was not to do what? To suffer and to die. Certainly, the Messiah would not be lifted up on a cross nor would that Messiah ask us to take up a cross. Just doesn't add up. And so I can see why the disciples were often slow to understand the teachings of Jesus. Three times throughout the Gospel of Mark, Jesus tells what's going to happen. And each time, there's not the full understanding. Now this call was not just reserved for those 12 disciples, but the call was there for all the crowds who were witnessing the miracles, who were hearing the teachings of Jesus. All who had witnessed such were called to take up the cross. Sometimes when we read the scriptures, it's good to, in, to put ourselves in the story. And we're always Easter people when we do so. We're always resurrection people but try to not have the rest of the story when we enter in to what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying the Messiah will suffer and die. Imagine. Imagine hearing this call to take up the cross without the understanding of resurrection. We only know what the cross means. The 
The cross is a form of execution implemented by the Roman authorities. It was a place where people judged fairly or unfairly, many times unfairly as criminals were condemned to die. People who were sentenced were invited, made to hold their crosses and drag them through the streets before they were lifted up as a way of mocking and humiliation and ridicule. It was also a very public event. The crosses were oftentimes raised right there along the side of the road. And there are certain times when there was an insurrection, there would be thousands of people on crosses. It served as a deterrent and also means to threaten and oppress people. And so people in the crowds, hearing Jesus speak about death, taking up a cross. They would know the scriptures. And there is this understanding in the scriptures, we get it in Deuteronomy, that anyone who's hung on a tree or a cross was viewed as being accursed by God. And yet, here's Jesus on his way to the cross, Here is Jesus inviting them to take up the cross and follow him. That's a tough ask. As the cross would mean self-denial, suffering, death. As the cross means we have to give up certain things in order to follow in this way. But then we also hear Jesus say, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. And when people in the early church heard or read Mark's gospel, they would find comfort and hope as they were picking up the cross, as they were experiencing suffering and persecution, as they were taking up the cross and following Jesus. And when Jesus asked us to take up the cross, When he mentions the words of taking up the cross, they then and we are now invited to love in the way of Jesus, to live sacrificially. And in doing so, we find our true selves when we give ourselves away and we let God in and God brings forth this newness of life as we lay ourselves down and God directs and fulfills. Before I talk about how we today in the church can pick up the cross, let me spend a few moments and say what it's not. I've often heard people say that something in their life is a cross they have to bear. I'm not asking you to raise your hand if you've ever said it. Or raise your hand if you've ever heard it. I've heard it. Maybe in my life I've even said it. Family member staying home to care for the needs of another. That's just a cross I have to bear. A doctor reveals test results revealing a troubling diagnosis and prognosis and we might be led to believe or think. That's just my lot in life. That's just the cross I've got to bear. Single parent with small children working two jobs trying to make ends meet and also loving and caring for her children alone might just say, this is just a cross I've got to bear. A college student starting out on his or her own, looking at the debt-to-earning ratio and looking at the cost of living and and scratching head going, what? (laughs) Well, this is just a cross I've got to bear. Everyone else is doing it. Those are just a sample of circumstances that people face. And no matter our lot in life, no matter how successful we've been, we've all had those moments or those situations when we might be led to think, well, this is just, this is just the way things are. And this is the cross I have to bear. Now, what we're saying, what we're acknowledging in those moments or situations that what we're dealing with, living with, at times is really hard. It can be difficult. 
And so I'm not making light of those situations. I'm not like making light of those moments. It's hard. It's hard watching a family member become so different than who they were as their physical or mental health declines. It's it's hard to go through tests and treatments and wondering, is this going to work? And wondering just how much time. It's hard to look to the future with hope when we're bogged down with bills and demands on our time and attention and just getting through to the end of the day to find some kind of peace seems like the greatest miracle. See, I imagine we can name our own difficult situations we're facing or have recently faced. But friends, that's not the cross Jesus is inviting you to pick up. It's not that God has willed this or or put such things in your life or on your life to endure as a test. You, here's your cross. It's living with grief that comes with the loss of a child. You over there, your cross, you deal with cancer. And you, your cross, your cross is an unfaithful spouse. While you're, your cross, you're gay. And you'll struggle with identity. And for the church to love you and accept you for years to come and argue about you for years. Those are not the crosses we're called to bear. Those are called situations and circumstances that come with being human and living with our bodies that age and break down, with living with a capacity to love deeply. And when we have that capacity to love deeply and that person is no longer here, what do we do? We grieve deeply. Instead of seeing such as crosses that we have to bear, as if God places this on us, we would do well to see that God is with us in life at each stage of life, that God is giving us strength for the journey and giving us wisdom as we face these challenges. And God is with us providing a way when we have lost our way. God's love is a constant when we experience times of transition and when life has gotten messy. Many of the hardships we face in life are not crosses we're called to pick up. That's not the invitation that Jesus was asking his followers to take up. Rather, we hear the call to deny self. Put God first. Serve not out of self-interest, but for others. We're to pick up our cross and follow in the way of discipleship. And so what does that look like? What does that look like for Great Bridge United Methodist Church? What does that look like for you? Some will hear the call to stand in the gap where there are injustices and be willing to give voice to those living not on the margins but beyond the margins, giving voice to the powerless. Some will hear the call to challenge racism by actively questioning the systems that are in place that perpetuate it. Some will hear the call to pick up the cross, and this looks like volunteering in the schools or in the afternoons of programming and ministering such love and care, ministering and mentoring those children who need attention and encouragement. Some will hear the call to go to the nursing homes to sing songs of faith on a memory care unit. And then watch the faces light up as they sing the songs of their youth. 
Some will hear the call to volunteer in the food shelter to help those with food insecurity. Still others will hear the call to pick up the cross and make connections with people who are living with isolation and are deeply lonely. There's so many bridges that we can go over, and that bridge is the cross. Are we willing to stand in the gap? Are we willing to go where God is calling us to go and do the things that God is calling us to do as we pick up the cross and follow Jesus? Jesus invites us to pick up the cross and and to follow him. In this season of Lent, I hope you will pick up that cross and follow with greater clarity and determination. I hope this will be a time of dying to self and taking up the cross that leads to greater and more fulfilled life as we carry the cross each day, not only in the season, but beyond Easter. And so friends, church, what is what is the cause? What is the ministry? What is the mission? What is the purpose? What is the cross? that Jesus is calling you this day. What are you hearing from Jesus as you hear Jesus say, if you want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.